And do you guys want a break in between repo and here? No. no. no? Okay. <laughs> Alright, yeah, so just start whenever. You don't need any. Yeah. Yeah. I think you can just. Yeah. Hey guys, can you hear me? Alright. Uh, so, okay, we better get started. My name is Lee, and today we'll just talk about um, reproductive system. Um, I'll try and make it quick, so then, you know, you can do him and go home, because nobody wants to study on Friday night. Um, so, first thing first is uh, gross anatomy. Um, so, you just got to know the bones of the pelvic girdle. So, obviously, um, all, all the main ones, and also, okay, how do I do this? Ah, all right, and um, and also be mindful of the yeah. So so just the, the small details because you might be asked to label them, um, and it's usually free marks. Um, so try and get them right. So know the pubic symphysis, the pubic crest, um, uh, the pubic tubercle. So the the the, the small ones, because uh, I'm sure you know the the main bones anyway. So that's easy. They're not going to test. All right, um, the with the pelvic girdle. We have different shapes, so uh, well four. But um, the main ones that you need to be mindful of is just the gynecoid and the android, obviously. So the gynecoid is the female um, pelvic girdle, and the android is for the male. Um, and uh, in Mo and Dali, there's a table that lists all the differences between them. So yeah, the female is just wider and um, yeah shorter because it's easy for childbirth, and the male is tall and narrow. And um, so it's it's pretty much. Um, uh, uh, common sense. And um, the other thing about the bones is that during pregnancy, uh, as you know already, the joints will relax due to hormone relaxing. Um, uh, and specifically the sacral elect joints as well as the pubic symphysis. Um, so therefore that allows it, the, the um, pelvic bones to increase in diameter, make it easier to um, get the baby out. Um, also, there's an increase in low doses of the spine of the pregnant lady and the coccyx move in posteriorly. So you see the very typical posture of a pregnant lady. All right, so uh, in terms of the pelvic cavity, I guess it's, yeah, it's good to just be mindful of the, the boundaries of it. So it's sort of common sense as well. So if you know the anatomy, you'll be able to work it out so you don't have to learn it by heart. But yeah, generally anterior wall is anything pubic. The lateral wall is the hip bones and the obturator muscles as well as foramen. So, you know, obturator is the keyword. Uh, the posterior wall is gonna be the sacrum and coccyx. 
as well as some um, piriformis muscles. And the pelvic floor is um, this one important, so you need to know. So that's um, levator ani and coccygeus muscles. All right. Um, yeah, so this is a, a good um, a illustration of it. So yeah, uh, with the levator ani, uh, the there, there are three. Yeah, there are a couple of components of it, but yeah, the pubic rectalis is the closest one to the the rectum, followed by the um, pubic coccygeus and the iliococcygeus. The coccygeus muscle is at the back here, uh, and um, yeah, and they provide support for the whole viscera, abdominal viscera. Um, all right. So generally, when we talk about muscles of the pelvic wall and floor, and um, it's four main things. So obturator internus, piriformis, um, coccygeus, and levator A9. So these two are for the floor and the other, the other two are for the walls. The obturator internus and piriformis, they are um, more muscles of the lower limb. So it's good to do a bit of revision on that as well. But um, the main action is for lateral rotation of the thigh. Right? And uh, piriformis also abduct the thigh. Um, and the levator A9 procedures, they are supportive muscle of the pelvic floor. Um, yeah, but the coccygeus also flex the coccyx, um, makes sense. Right. And um, they are innovation, they are just innovated by nerve to levator A9, nerve to coccygeus, um, and it's the, the sacral um, roots, so S2, S4 and uh, S5. All right, so the other thing about the pelvic floor support is in female, you have, um, you have two things. So you have the cardinal ligaments and you have the tendinous, oh, this is in male as well, but you have the tendinous arc of the, the levator A9. So um, apart from the muscles, you have the ligaments and they also, um, they also support the pelvic floor. Um, yeah, and it's especially important in female because it's really easy to get um, vaginal prolapse. All right, um, so yeah, so injury can happen to the pelvic floor, which includes the muscles and the um, ligaments and everything, and it can um, specifically occur in childbirth. So, for example, in this case, you see a... Uh, okay, I just realized, do you, do you see my, the mouse? Okay, yeah. Jeez. Okay, so how do we how do we work the mouse here? Huh? Yeah, because like all right, yeah, probably just do that. Right, that's better. I've been pointing. Um, okay. So yeah, so um, you get damage to the the you know pubic rectalis or any other component of the levator A9 that can affect the the urinary continence um, as well as fecal continence. So anything con incontinence, um, it will be pubic pubic rectalis. If you see a question, all right. So uh, just a quick question to help you revise: which uh, structure is found in males? Yep. So yeah. So the answer is rectal vesical pouch. Um, obviously, because in female you have the uterus as well, so the the bladder and the rectum is not in contact. Um, and uh, so, ischial anal fossa. It's you know it's ischial and anal, so it's related to the anal. So it's nothing to do with difference in gender. Um, the genital hiatus is the thing that only that you only have in in female. So that's like a, a, an area, a spacious area between the the urethra and the entrance, so the vagina. So it's only in female. The ischial cavernous, cavernous muscle is present in both. So this is male here and female, so you both have that. Um, and swing to urethra muscle in both as well. Okay, another one. <coughs> So, so um, this one um, symbol, the answer is just levator A9. All right, so anything, because um, injury to the pelvic floor, it's likely that one. It's not that 
um, uh, tricky when you know it, it gives different answers as components of the level A9, then it's a bit hard to tell. Um, but yeah, generally, um, the bulbous spongiosis constricts the vaginal orifice, so it, it's not going to affect um, the bladder and um, obturator internus and piriformis, so the um, lower limb muscles. <coughs> Okay, so the other thing is just neuromusculature, and uh, it's just a very complicated diagram, but basically with the nerves in the pelvic region, um, when you learn neurovasculature, try to learn them as a systemic kind of thing, so don't learn them as you go along and learn the, the repro system or you know the GI or the the the, the urinary system, um, it gets really confusing and you don't have the big picture. So when you learn neurovasculature, just learn them as a whole and as a separate thing. Um, so yeah, so basically around the the pelvic sacral area, you have the sacral canal. That's where um, the cauda equina and you know everything, um, and they will exit through the sacral foramen. So you have the dorsal ventral roots. They come out. The dorsal is afferent and ventral is efferent fibers. Um, the important ones are the pelvic splenic nerves. So they come out from um, from one of the foramina, from so from the sacral um, canal as well. And uh, pelvic is parasympathetic fibers. Um, um, another important one is pudendal nerve. So they it goes out is um, root S two S two S four. Um, and it join it, it goes it travels together with the internal pudendal vessels in the um, pudendal canal, right? Um, and so uh, this is another um, representation. So you see here the sciatic nerve, the pudendal nerve, the the um, sacral foramina here. So next to it you see the parasympathetic chain. So from the parasympathetic chain you have the sacral splatnic nerves and these are the sympathetic ones All right. so um, in terms of vessels um, I guess it, it's good to just pinpoint a couple of things so in male or only in male you have inferior visical arteries right? so in female the equivalent one will be the vaginal artery and these two will give branches to in male it, it will give branches to the ductus deferens and the prostate and of course in only in female do you have the uterine artery um, speaking of the uterine artery it's good to remember the phrase water under the bridge so water is referring to ureter and bridges in this case is the uterine artery so it's a, an, an interesting anatomical fact you have the urinary bladder here you have the ure the, the uterus Right. And um, the uterus is supplied by the uterine artery here. And um, so the ureter will run underneath the uterine artery. And uh, the significance of this is in um, hysterectomy when you have to remove the ureters. Uh, the, 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 the uterus, you need to clamp the uterine artery and it's easy to damage the ureter. Okay, so um, the most important artery of the pelvic perineum area is the internal iliac artery because you know the common iliac artery will bifurcate into internal and external so external will go on to supply the lower limb um, mainly and uh, the internal iliac artery is the main one in the pelvic and perineum so internal iliac is uh, further divided into posterior and anterior division so just remember the posterior is it has less branches so just iliolumbar, lateral sacral, and superior gluteal. The rest is going to be the anterior from the anterior division, um, and the very important one is the internal pudendal artery because that's the one that's going to go and supply um, most of the structure in the perineum. Um, okay, and you can read the in details in your own time. Okay, so the other important thing is the venous system, so the, the portal caval anastomosis. Um, and in, in your um, body, there are six sites of potential anastomosis between the portal system and the um, caval system. Uh, the three main thing that we remember is around the lowest esophagus, so that's where the left gastric vein meets the azagous vein. Um, Around the second one is in the upper anal canal, where um, the superior rectal vein meets the middle or inferior rectal vein. 
and in the umbilical region, um, where you have the vein of ligamentum teres, um, meeting superior inferior epigastric veins. Um, the rest is less talked about. Um, so yeah, so when you have um, portal hypertension or something, and then uh, you have increased um, um, pressure in this area, you will have um, esophageal varices um, or potential hemorrhage. If it happens in the anal canal, then you have hemorrhoids. Um, and in umbilical regions, um, yeah, you, you see um, in large veins there as well. All right. So yeah, um, be mindful of the lymph nodes. Um, so it, 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 the names of the lymph nodes just depend on where they are. So lumbar, um, common iliac, external, internal, um, deep and superficial. Uh, it's actually better to put them into context. So uh, in terms of venous, venous system and lymphatic system, um, they are important when we talk about the spread of cancer. So um, this is what happens in male and this is what happens in females. So it's just two columns. In the internal male genitalia, so anything inside, like prostate, so um, uh, like testis or vas deferens, um, if you have cancer there, then it's spread into the prostatic venous plexus, which then go on to um, the vesicle venous plexus or the internal vertebral um, venous plexus. So bottom line is, if you have prostate cancer, it can spread into your back. Um, if it's in the scrotum, so this is a superficial area, it will go into external pudendal vein. So you see the external or superficial. So the spread will be superficial first. Um, the penis is special because the skin of the penis uh, will have a similar pattern of spread to the scrotum, but deep. Um, so yeah, so urethra and everything, it's going to be the same as the internal male genitalia. The female is uh, simpler. So if it's internal female, so uterus, um, yeah, the main thing, then it goes into the uteral vaginal venous plexus um, and um, the vulva, so the perineum, then it's the internal pudendal vein. So anything perineal, you'll see the internal pudendal vessels a lot. Um, the ovary is yeah, kind of special because the first spread is going to go into the inferior vena cava or the left venal vein, renal vein. All right. Okay, so let's talk a bit about the organ. So with male, um, you have the vas def. The vas def has a thick muscular wall and um, it basically joins the seminal, the duct of the seminal glands to form the ejaculatory ducts. This has a significance in the sterilization. So you do this by vasectomy. Um, yeah, so it's a good contraception. The seminal glands itself, they are, if they get um, abscess, then and rupture, then the pus can enter the peritoneum and you have peritonitis, all that sort of complication. The ejaculatory duct arise near the neck of the bladder and it opens into the seminal colliculus in the prostatic urethra. It's just the main thing you need to remember. The bulbar urethral gland, or also called the cow glands, they secret during the sexual arousal. Um, and they, they're funny in that they are they're, they're posterior, posterior lateral to the intermediate part of the urethra. So, you know, the prostate part of urethra here, this is the intermediate part um, going down. That's the spongy part. Um, so the bulbar urethral glands are here, but they open into the proximal spongy urethra. So that's why you get the secretion. Uh, um, oh, and they're also embedded in the external urethral sphincter, which is around here as well. So the external urethral sphincter is also in the intermediate um, urethra. Okay, the prostate is, um, well, it's a lot of details, but mainly um, it's, it's asymmetrical. So the anatomy of it is very interesting, but it's two third glandular and one third fibromuscular. It has a, fibro, it has a fibrous capsule <coughs> that contains neurovasculature. The lobes of it, you have the isthmus, which is uh, here. Um, the isthmus is fibromuscular and it's actually the, continuation of the external urethral sphincter. 
and you see how the, yeah and then the, the other one is the right and left lobes so the 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 anatomy is sort of like thyroid you know you have the isthmus and then you, you have the lobes on two sides um but these ones they're further divided into the lobules you, it, the the name of them is kind of weird but um the main ones remember is you have the inferior posterior parts so this is the part of the prostate that you're going to palpate when you do a direct rectal examination the superior medial part is here and it's the part that surrounds the ejaculatory ducts and then you also have the anterior medial parts that you can't see here but you can see here well and um, it's directly lateral to the prostatic urethra you can also divide it into zones but it doesn't matter and the prostatic ducts will open and secrete um, thin milky fluid so these contain the citric acid plus min antibody and um, prostate specific antigen so yeah so clinical significance is when you have prostate enlargement in bph or in cancer um, and then that affects um, that gives you urinary symptoms the scrotum is not much to talk about. Um, you just know that the septum of the scrotum is a continuum of the data's fascia. Uh, the penis is, um, yeah, so with the penis, you yeah, know the different parts of it um, and look at the cross section. So, yeah, be aware of the part that surround the urethra is going to be the corpus spongiosum um, and the other parts are corp corpora cavernosa with the deep artery running through it. Um, it has two ligaments supporting it as well. Um, and the significance thing with this is if you have um, a damage or an injury or something to the spongy, the, the corpus spongiosum, then you might have a urine, a, a urine leakage um, from, the, from, the, from the ventral part of the penis. Um, any damage to the corpora cavernosa would not cause any urinary leakage unless it, it also involves the corpus spongiosum. And that's that. Okay, so just a quick question. Okay, so yeah, so this one, the answer is ejaculatory ducts. Um, so we just talked about just then that the, the ejaculatory ducts um, opens into the posterior wall of the prostatic urethra. So if you see that, then it's going to be this one. Um, not duct of seminal vesicle or ductus deferens because those two join together to become the ejaculatory duct before it opens into the urethra. Um, so the, the very, the, the closest, structure to it this is going to be the ejaculatory duct the fossa navicularis um, we don't have to remember much but it's <laughs> essentially this part um so the the very final distal part of the spongy urethra and um seminiferous tube obviously not okay all right so it's talk about um visceral organ of the female so if female you have the ovaries ovaries um they are suspended by a number of ligaments i guess the important ones are the suspensory ligaments which is these ones here because they contain the ovarian vessels um and yeah and the rest is just there okay so the uterine tubes um the ligament that support the uterine tubes are called the mesosalpings um there are four parts to it we've got the uterine part isthmus ampulla and infundibulum um, you can get salmongitis and again this can lead to peritonitis um, and when you do um, you can do a, 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 some sort of um, sterilization by tubal ligation when ectopic uh, pregnancy occur uh, specifically ectopic, ectopic tubal pregnancy the common site is going to be the ampulla um, and yeah, it can rupture and it can cause hemorrhage as well as peritonitis. Um, sometimes you have remnants of the embryonic ducts in the mesosalpings and that can form cyst. Okay. Uh, so yeah, the next one is the uterus. The uterus, the common position is, I'm sorry for this, but it's anti and anti-flexed. 
just remember the name of it. And um, yeah, the wall of it has three layers. So perimetrium, myometrium and endometrium. Um, it has a couple of ligaments supporting it, um, specifically the, the round ligament of uterus and the broad ligaments. So you can have abnormalities in the anatomy. So the shape of the uterus, the different shapes here. Um, and it, you can have um, disposition or prolapse of the uterus that can happen if you have raised intra-abdominal pressure. So um, in, you know, obesity um, and uh, yeah, or, or, or it happens when you disrupt the perineal body, which is this part, um, this part, all right, this part around here. Uh, it doesn't show very well. Um, or injury to the pelvic floor or even just atrophy. So pretty much childbirth or um, aging. Right. And um, in the perineum, you have the vagina and the vulva. Um, so you know the different parts of the vulva, specifically the vestibule, because this one, this one contains a lot of important structures for physiology. So this is where you have the opening of the urethra, the opening of the, you have the vagina, and you have the opening of the different glands that are important during um, 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 sexual activity um, and it's surrounded by the vestibule is surrounded by the bulbous spongiosus so this is an important muscle to remember um, yeah and, uh, and then you have the, the glands citrus okay so quick question <coughs> Yep, so the answer is the ampulla. Um, it's just the way it is. Okay, next one. All right, so the answer is, is the cervix of the uterus. So the key word here is um, it's a firm structure. So you can palpate a lot of things um, in a in a rectal examination, depend depend on how far you can reach and you know the position as well. But um, because it's a firm structure, then it, it's the cervix. <clears throat> okay, so yeah, that's uh, that for gross anatomy. In terms of histology, with the male, um, the the idea is you got to know the cells of the testis and their function, the process of spermatogenesis. Um, following by spermiogenesis and sperm maturation and histology of the postesticular duct and glands as well as the pathology that can go with it. So um, the optimal temperature for testis is around 34, so two or three degree below body temperature. Um, the important structures are the trimester muscle, the fascia, as well as the, the pampiniform plexus. Um, because all of them are involved in in um, controlling the temperature of the test of the testis. So the first cells to know in the testis is the sertoli cells. So sertoli cell it, it looks very different. So if you see the histology, uh, it's kind of tree shaped. It's um, it's tall and thin. It's very different from the other um, spermatogonia. spermatogonia. Um, it has receptors for testosterone and FSH. And it's really important to know the function. So, you know, there's a whole list of it of the sertoli cells. So generally it's a supportive role of spermatogenesis. Um, it's released GDN and F, and this is for self renewal of the spermatogonia. The um, SRY is for sex determination. Um, sertoli also secretes AMH. Um, that is important for early fetal life and inhibin and activin. Um, hormones which regulates FSH secretion and it forms the blood testis barrier. So it's a lot of function, a lot of hormones um, that comes from sertoli. Compared to sertoli, Leydig is very simple. It produces androgen or testosterone in response to LH. Um, so that's just the pretty much the main role of, of Leydig. Leydig is not inside the seminiferous tubule, it's outside. Um, and when it releases the engine, the engine will then diffuse into the <coughs> seminiferous tubules and then into the bloodstream and reach the target organs and tissues. So and do what testosterones usually do. So you know, help you gain muscle mass um, or make you lose hair, sort of thing. 
oh, lose scalp hair, but you know, gain body hair, whatever. Um, so you have the seminiferous epithelium, and um, this one, it obviously contained the spermatogonia, and they are usually at different stages. So it, there might be, you know, like a, a question um, showing you a histology slides and asking you what stage of this might the the sperm the the sperm the the germ cell be. So is it like primordial or primary or secondary or already a spermatozoa? So you got to be able to recognize that it's lined the the um, seminiferous epithelium is lined by thin contractile um, myoid cell. So it's those around here. Okay, um, so spermatogenesis, mm, it's an important process. Just a couple of um, numbers here. So the testis volume is around 12 to 25 milliliter. Um, sperm production is 100, and, 100 million a day. And it usually takes about 70 days, so two months-ish, to produce a spermatozoa. So for one spermatogonia, to go through this whole process and become the spermatozoa. Um, yeah, so you start off um, as a primordial germ cell or spermatogonia, um, you become primary, and, and then you undergo first meiosis, you become secondary spermatocytes, um, you, and then you go through the second meiosis and you become spermatid, um, and then spermiogenesis occurs, so you become you know, sperm cell. Uh, yeah, so so yeah, so this is a good picture showing the different um, appearance of it, and as well as location. So the spermatogonium is going to be at the very end, so at the epithelium of the seminiferous ferrous tubule. Um, and then when you go inside, you have spermatocytes um, or sperm. Okay, I don't know what I did. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, <laughs> you don't know why. Yeah, I don't know why. Wait. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't know. Uh, Did they just... <laughs> So do you do you know? I have no idea what happened. Okay, no. Okay, what happened now? Um, I think it's just a lag. Oh, do you want to go back to? Yeah, I want to go back to. The, um, okay. All right. Um, and yeah, you can see the subtly cell here, so it looks pretty different. Um, and uh, yeah, this is a round spermatid, and you have an elongated sperm here. So yeah, so if you if you're gonna learn something for histology, it's gonna be something like this. Just the different stages of sperm spermatogenesis. Hi. Um, and yeah, and then you have the where, while um, meiosis is occurring, the all the spermatocytes and spermatids are still connected to each other by something called the syncytium. Just know that it's there. All right. So yeah, and um, this is just meiosis the product of it, so before you have diploid and after you divide everything out, um, you have haploid gametes. All right, so uh, it's important to remember, um, the reason we have meiosis is because it's good for genetic variation. So three things happen in meiosis that allows this. So you have the crossing over that happened during prophase. You have independent assortment of chromosomes during metaphase. And then you have random fertilization um, that gives you up to 64 million combinations. 
So that's why you're unique. Okay, so yeah, spermiogenesis occur after spermatogenesis. So this is where the spermatozoa or spermatids um, undergo a couple of transformations and then become um, a sperm. Um, and those things are, you have nuclear compaction. So the nucleus sort of, you know, shrink, um, just, just become more compact. Um, you lose the cytoplasm, you develop a tail, and then you, your, um, you develop acrosome, which is important for acrosome, acrosomal reaction later on. Okay. Oh, and then sperm can become abnormal. All right. So after the sperm is produced in the test, the, the testis, um, it will go into the reed testis and then efferent ductals and then reach the epididymis and then get out and into the vas deferens and then into the ejaculatory ducts. So it joins together with the um, the secretion from the seminal vesicles, um, as well as secretion from the prostate and everything. So yeah, um, eventually you have semen. So the epididymis um, structure, it's lined by pseudostratified epithelium. It has smooth muscle. So pretty much all of, all of the tubules in the testis and after is gonna have smooth muscles because you need that for contraction that um, move the sperm along. Um, so it makes sense. So there's a sperm inside here. Um, the function here is at the epididymis, the sperm can gain initial motility um, and the ability to fertilize, and it can be stored in the, in the epididymis. So the vas deferens is the same, except it has even more smooth muscles because the function is contractile. The seminal vesicles, um, they are quite different in, in that they have very highly folded epithelium. So if you see something like this, then it's a seminal vesicle. It secretes some um, white or yellow viscous fluid. And these contain this, this contain fructose or other sugars or ascorbic acid. So you have to do secretion to sort of learn the components, which is the prostatic and um, the, the seminal. So then yeah, it combined with secretion from the prostate. <coughs> Okay, so abnormalities at this point um, is cryptocortism, so undescend testes. Um, normally, uh, testes got to descend by nine months. Um, if not, then you will have spermatogenic failure um, and leading to infertility. And um, you can have testicular, testicular cancer, and 90% of testicular cancer is germ cell um, derived. Okay, quick question. Yep, so the answer is um, seminal fluid and prostatic fluid. So just pretty much three things. So you have sperm, the seminal fluid, and the prostatic. So if you um, don't, don't have sperm from the vast depth, then it's the other two. Okay, um, true or false? Okay, um, so yeah, so the first statement certainly self produced spermatozoa. That's obviously false. It's just spermatozoa is already there. Um, certainly cells produce a bunch of hormones, but not that cell. Um, certainly cells produce inhibit. That's true. So that's one of the hormones that it produces uh, in support to the whole process. The blood testis barrier, it, it actually prevents the germ cells from being exposed to harmful circulating substance or the immune system. Um, it, it has nothing to do with the testis temperature because like we said in the, the first slide of the section, um, it's to do with the pampinus, um, venous plexus um, and the cremaster muscle. Okay, all right. So in terms of female, um, we have a couple of structures. So the ovary, the ovary, this is a typical one, so it's lined by um, simple squamous epithelium as well as the tunica abuginia from peritoneum. And inside, in the cortex, you have a lot of follicles, and in the medulla, you have a lot of um, loose connective tissue as well as some um, vessels. So, yeah, be mindful of the number of follicles over time, so you always decrease, um, and uh, yeah. So, follicular genesis, um, 
the process is you start off with primordial follicle. When you become primary, you gain zona pellucida and the granulosa cells start to develop and increase in numbers. Um, so, so as you go along, the, the cells will increase in numbers uh, and you will have different new structures. So when you become secondary, um, everything looks much, much more developed. You start to have thicker cells. And when you reach tertiary, which is around like pre -ant or graphian, um, which is the other name, uh, then you have the antrum in there and you have a, a very thick layer of granulosa cells um, and theca as well. Okay, so um, this is the, this is the um, oocyte. It's lined by the zona pellucida here. Um, and outside that is the granulosa cell. This part here is sort of a bridge um, uh, and it's, it's gonna be severed when you ovulate. Okay, so after ovulation, um, the ruptured follicle will become corpus luteum and they start to secret, it starts to secrete progesterone. If no pregnancy occurs, then corpus luteum becomes corpus albicans. Um, and the unovulated follicles will undergo atresia. Okay, so the oviducts, um, the oviducts have three layers. Um, the mucosal one it has secretory cells, and these uh, secretory cells are important for nutrients for the egg, as well as um, precipitate in the capacitation of spermatozoa. Um, the the muscularis muscle around here is also important because um, it works for propulsion of the gametes and the embryos. So you gotta you gotta propose it along and do it by you know, yeah muscle contraction um, in order to get it down from the duct into the lining of the uterus. All right, and the uterus. I'm sure you know all of these three layers. Um, the endometrium is a C ciliated simple columnar epithelium. Um, and you can also classify it as functionalis or basalis, um, but it doesn't matter much. Okay, yeah, so this is the endometrium in proliferative phase, and this is, uh, no, secretory phase, and this is in the proliferative phase. Okay, so that's that for histology. Um, so we'll do quickly on physiology. Basically, you start off with puberty, so everything starts off with puberty. Um, and in puberty, the first thing it, do, it does is hormonal changes. Um, so you know that with um, FSH and LH, when you are just born, so when you're in infancy, you have really high amount of FSH and LH, and then they sort of go down again. And when you reach puberty, then it starts to increase again. And it's the same pattern with um, GnRH. Um, because FSH and LH are controlled by GnRH. All right, the other concept before we talk about uh, puberty is atrinaki. So it's it's a critical onset of puberty, and it happens around eight year old. So a couple of years before puberty actually happens, and this is due to the increase in zona reticularis steroid production. Um, so you start to get some pubic or axillary hair, and that's all you need to know. All right, so with puberty, you have physical changes. First thing is the, the growth spurts. Um, so you, you, it, you grow taller really quickly. And um, it, in female, it happens um, earlier than male, but the age can vary. And um, you also have sex specific growth. So in male, you have, you have increase in lean mass and you have increase in shoulder width. In female, you increase fat, fat mass and the hip width. All right, and um, the tennis stages are just um, common sense, I guess. So the different stages that happen to pubic hair and um, breasts. Okay, oh, oh, this one you can read on your own, it's fine. Okay, the pathology of, um, of puberty that can happen, you have Kalman syndrome. So Kalman syndrome is when you have delayed or absent puberty, and this happens due to hypothalamic hypogonadism that is associated with anosmia, which is the inability to smell. Um, and it has to do with the calgene 
Okay, the second one is Macuna Bright, I'm sure you've heard of as well. It's a genetic condition. Um, and apart from hormone balance, it also affects bone growth and lead to skin pigmentation. So the other two um, we've heard before, so Turner syndrome is when you have 45X and Kleinfelter is um, 47XXY and both of them um, lead to abnormal um, sexual characterization. Okay, so that's it for puberty. Fertilization, in order to fertilize, you need to prepare it. And first you have to prepare the egg, you prepare the egg and the, firm, the, and the sperm. So you prepare the egg by, you know, uh, stimulating um, follicular maturation. So follicular genesis, genesis and um, oocyte maturation. <coughs> sperm, um, you prepare it by a capacitation and be acrosome, acrosomal reaction. So capacitation is acquired because you have a lot of changes to the sperm plasma membrane. This would then allow it to increase motility and also prepare it to undergo acrosomal reaction. So in acrosomal reaction, the sperm binds to the ZP3 receptor on the zona pellucida of the egg, which then open calcium channel that, lead to, that leads to calcium influx into the sperm um, and then trigger acrosomal reaction. And eventually the sperm will release hydrolytic enzymes. So this is the, a series of steps. Um, and you have this slide, so um, you can always go back later. Okay, um, so yeah, speaking of the, the receptors, so the ZP3 receptors are the, are the ones that bind acrosomal intact sperm and then induce the acrosomal reaction. ZP2 receptor will only then bind to acrosomal reactive sperm. So that's the difference between the two of them. All right, and when you have fusion of the oocytes and sperm membranes, um, these are just buzzwords, but you have certain proteins on the membranes of each of the gametes to help them do the fusion. So in the egg, it's a CD9 <laughs> protein, and in the sperm, it's the Ismol protein. Okay, so um, in egg activation and um, early embryo, so, so after the fusion occur, um, you, 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 um, a, a process of egg activation will begin. And that's, there are actually two parts to it. So first you have the cortical granule exocytosis. So what this does is, again, uh, there's a release of a lot of enzymes. Um, and eventually, the, the whole point of it is to prevent polyspermic fertilization. So once a sperm binds to the egg, um, the membrane of it will change so that no other sperm can bind to it anymore. So it's only that one sperm, and that's it. Um, and then the second thing ha that happens is cell cycle resumption. So in both of them, um, oh, in the egg, um, even with follicular genesis, the, the meiosis will be arrested at meta metaphase two. So it only resumes after fertilization occur. So after this occur, um, the male and female nuclei will then become pronuclei, and then they fuse together. And you develop uh, and you have a diploid zygotes, which then starts mitosis immediately, which is cleavage, and they go really quickly. Okay, so that brings us to implantation and placental growth. So again, um, just to summarize it, the, from the process of fertilization to implantation, um, you go from zygote to marula to blastocyst. And usually at this pla at um, the blastocyst stage that you have implantation. So implantation starts to happen at around six to seven days after fertilization occur. And um, yeah, so at, as a blastocyst, you have um, a layer of trophoblast. And uh, the trophoblast is the ones that help you bind into the endometrium of the uterus. So there are two layers to the trophoblast, and the, the, the ones with the longer name is the one that invade and digest endometrium. So as you can see here, yeah, the one outside. 
goes in there. Okay. Um, yeah. And then after that, after implantation occur, um, then the blastocysts start to, to keep dividing and, and grow. So complete implantation will happen around two weeks after ovulation. Um, and so uh, when implantation happen, what happened is the blastocyst, or more specifically, the syncytiotrophic glass layer will secrete um, HCG. And then HCG will go and act on corpus luteum. The corpus luteum will then release uh, estrogen and mainly progesterone, which then maintain the pregnancy until the placenta develops and then take over um, progesterone secretion. So this is around um, eight weeks. Okay, so um, there are a couple of implantation issues. Um, implantation can fail to occur, and it's actually two out of three times. Um, and out of out of the times that it does occur, one third will miscarry. So there are a lot of reasons and a lot of a lot of medical conditions that can um, cause uh, miscarriage. Uh, but yeah, you don't need to know too much um, because it's just mm, fourth year. And um, the other thing that happened is ectopic pregnancy, obviously. Um, and you can also get placenta previa. So this is a condition where normally the placenta will be here, but um, in placenta previa, it implants near the cervix and it increases the risk of miscarriage. Okay, so um, there are a lot of membranes when um, in the uterus with, with the baby, um, but the main thing to know is the amniotic fluids. So th this one, so the fluid in here, they act as, as a cushion, um, and uh, it it allows an environment for the fetus to grow, develop muscles, develop um, their organs, um, to maintain a constant temperature, and um, yeah, and and it contains mostly waste, obviously, so urine and everything. Um, yeah, it's around one liter. Okay, so the placenta is another important one. It's a discoid-shaped structure, um, weigh half a kilo. There is the fetal component to the placenta, so that's derived from the chorionic, the chorion or the chorionic villi. Um, and you have a maternal component where there's an erosion from the endometrial cells. Um, the function of the placenta is good to remember. So it provides gases and nutrients. It also removes wastes. Um, it acts as a partial immune barrier, and it synthesizes and secretes hormones for pregnancy maintenance. Okay, so uh, this is too complicated, but remember this one. So you have the placenta, this is fetus, and this is mother. So um, blood from fetus and mother remain separate. Um, you have the umbilical artery coming from fetus to the placenta, and then um, the other way around and then from the mother between the mother and the placenta is the uterine artery and vein okay so transport across the placenta it can be tricky so you have the the same different kind of, tra of, of transport as you have in the normal cells um, but remember that placenta is permeable to alcohol that's why you can have fetal alcohol syndrome when the mother is an alcoholic um, but it's imp impermeable to large proteins um, and it's imperme impermeable to blood cells. Okay, so um, we just said that the placenta synthesizes and secretes a lot of hormones. So one of them is, um, it, like, or two of them, a progesterone and estrogen. So in pregnancy, um, during pregnancy, you have a lot of um, a, a, a lot of um, um, estrogen compared to progesterone, um, but um, towards the end of pregnancy, progesterone will increase compared to estrogen. So the ratio changes, um, and that's what allow um, childbirth, so population to occur. So that's why if you want to um, have an abortion, then you can you can um, take drugs that block 
progesterone and that will cease pregnancy immediately. Um, okay, so uh, what progesterone does specifically is smooth muscle relaxation. So you don't want the uterus to contract yet. You want to maintain it, let it grow, um, make it healthy first. And uh, in estrogen, uh, estrogen, uh, what it does is for uterine growth and to increase blood flow again to maintain pregnancy. Okay, so yeah, um, be mindful of the maternal adaptations, so the physiological adaptations to pregnancy. Um, so you gain weight, obviously, you have cardiovascular changes, so you increase cardiac output as well as blood volume, um, increased ventilation, you have, you have increased glucose, um, and uh, yeah, so again, increased fluid retention so in renal function so you have so you can have edema so swollen ankle and everything um right yeah and then the rest okay so just a quick question true or false Okay. Um, I so um, let's look at the answer. So yeah, so implantation begins with attachment of the blastocyst to the endometrium. That's what we just said then. Um, the endometrial cells of the uterus do not form the trophoblast. The trophoblast is just a layer from the blastocyst, so from the from the zygote itself that has nothing to do with the endometrium. Um, it's just after this, the trophoblast will allow implantation into the endometrial wall. And um, yeah, the, okay, so yeah, it's just, um, I guess it's fun fact, but the trophoblast is the, the layer that eventually grow and develop into, um, and, and give rise to the placenta. So that's the fetal component of the placenta. Um, and this should be straightforward. So because, you know, pregnancy, you test for HCG and not, um, not estradiol. All right. Okay, another one. All right. Um, okay, so let's look at the answers. So, all right, so um, last night, albumin. So, when you're pregnant, the the total amount of albumin actually does not change, but the concentration of albumin will be low because you have increased blood volume, but the blood component, so that's not the, the albumin. So the albumin remains the same, but the blood volume is increased. So concentration actually decreases, um, which then predisposes you to some a lot of edema and everything. Um, in pregnancy, you have you do have increased clearance of iodine. That's why pregnant lady are more likely to have goiter. Um, and the umbilical arteries, so when you talk about the arteries, I had somebody say this, so the arteries are the thing that go away from, from the body. So um, 
it's and the umbilical artery is the ones that supply the that goes between the placenta and the fetus but it goes away from the fetus and to the placenta so it's not the other way around um, and the component of the the blood component of the umbilical artery is actually deoxygenated so because yeah so it's the opposite from the maternal one yeah so just yeah think about it carefully and um and and you'll be able to work it out um and yeah the last one is true so estrogen is important all right so um in terms of fetal growth be mindful that birth weight is important and it can be affected by a couple of things so genetic maternal nutrition um or just endocrine in general so growth hormone is important thyroid hormone insulin um, lexitin is an indicator of lung surfactant level so i guess it's a buzzwordy kind of thing and um, the prepartum cortical search so before birth you have a, a search of cortisol and this help differentiation further and just um, the final development of it okay uh, oh yeah quick question pick the correct statement Okay, so, um, so the answer is A. And, um, um, and yeah, it, it's just, it, it's just an interesting fact, but yeah, so some of, you know, you wonder where the fluid come from. So the amniotic fluid that's around the fetus during pregnancy, that's actually filtration from the, the blood vessels itself, but not the blood component, only the, the plasma ish components. The amniotic fluid is both swallowed and inhaled by the fetus. So remember how I said it's an environment that allow the fetus to sort of practice and grow muscles and develop organs. So if it's swallowed, then it develops its GIT. And um, if it's inhale and exhale it, then it's, it's a way to develop the lung system. Um, so it does both. And um, fetus actually has a higher metabolic rate than adults it's just the way they're born um that's why they need a lot of food to grow um and compared to an adult the newborn baby's blood has a higher affinity for blood so hbf has really high um oxygen affinity okay so do after pregnancy is population the the signal for birth, we know that it arises from the uterus, but the exact mechanism is unknown. Um, and yeah, just the terms of them. So eurotrophic factors are the, the factors that prepare the uterus for contraction. Uterotonic is the one that induces the contraction. And both of these are inhibited by progesterone and potentiated by estrogen so again if you take away something progesterone relax the muscle so it inhibits uterine contraction and that's why the pregnancy is maintained if you inhibit if you block progesterone then uterine contraction will occur and if it occurs too early then you have abortion okay so um I guess you're um, familiar with the, the Ferguson reflex. Um, the important hormones are here. So prostaglandin plays a role as well. It's synthesized by the placenta and it activates the myometrium. Right? Oxytocin is also something that um, that's important. It's, um, it, it correlates with, it also correlates with uterine activity. So occasional contraction or Preston Hicks, that's what it's called. And uh, it can be administered exogenously to induce labor. So that's one of the hormone 
if you want to induce labor, you give. All right. So this is the, the Ferguson reflex. So basically you have a baby, the baby move into deeper into the birth canal. So then um, that that um, stimulate the receptors in the cervix, which then send signal to the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus then signal the pituitary to produce oxytocin and oxytocin will then um, go into uterine muscle and cause it to contract even more. So um, it's a it's a positive feedback mechanism. All right. So um, the stages of labor. There are three stages. Um, three stages. That's the takeaway message. Um, you have an onset of contraction, um, which then lead into cervix dilation, and after that, when you have full dilation, is the delivery stage. And after that, finally, is you have the expulsion of the placenta. Okay, and the the process of cervix dilation is initiated by prostaglandin, so PGE two. Okay, all right. Question. <laughs> okay, so here are the answers. All right, yeah. Um so so if you remember the the di diagram from earlier, remember that pro progesterone is for relaxation of the uterus to, of the uterine muscle. So towards the term which is approaching childbirth, you would want um, contraction of the uterine muscle. So you have decreased component of progesterone, but increased estrogen. Um, remember, yeah, remember this, the, the fetal glucocorticoid is just um, another word for cortical surge. So towards the end of pregnancy, you have a cortical surge, um, a, a, a cortisol, sorry, a cortisol surge. Um, and yeah, yeah, that's that happens and it's important as well. So it's not a fault, it's an increase. Um, oxytocin or estrogen, they may trigger uterine contraction because we just talked about Ferguson reflex um, as well as estrogen being um, a, a contraction um, inducer. Um, and yeah, they can be used to induce labor. And um, beta adrenergic drug, this is important. It's, it's interesting because um, in the uterus, um, the B, the beta adrenergic receptors, um, which is the sympathetic nerves, they actually have an inhibitory effects on the uterine muscle. So when you activate sympathetic fibers, you will lead to um, uterine relaxation instead of contraction. So yeah, so it's the other way around. So if you have a beta adrenergic drug, um, it will inhibit labor. Okay, so hopefully um, with lactation, um, remember that the important thing about lactation is just the changes in hormones and what hormones lead to lactation. So during pregnancy, um, it's estrogen and progesterone that will increase um, breast development. Um, and, uh, and during birth, at, at birth, the, these hormones will start to decrease and lactation will occur two or three days afterwards. So that's just the general process of it. 
Um, in lactation, the, the lactogenesis too, you have a lot of milk. So in one, you only have, you have like small amounts, so colostrum, but in two, you have copious milk um, and you have increased amount of prolactin. So I guess the important one is um, the letdown reflex of the um, milk ejection. So you, you start off with um, a suckling activity, would then send afferent fiber up to the spinal cord and then up to the brainstem um, and up to the, yeah, eventually to the hypothalamus, which is the um, supraoptic nerve and paraventricular, um, supraoptic nucleus and paraventricular nucleus. And um, these ones will send signal down to release oxytocin. Oxytocin will act on the myoepithelium of the breast and that leads to milk ejection. Um, so the bottom line is that lactogenesis depends on <coughs> estrogen and progesterone, but milk ejection depends on oxytocin. Okay, quick question. all right so the answer is c and um okay so i'll explain it so with a um during pregnancy the uterine muscle will enlarge but that's due to hypertrophy and not hyperplasia so the cells just become bigger it does not increase in number um the breast enlargement during pregnancy is due to effects of estrogen and progesterone not prolactin so prolactin is strictly for milk formation um only so because prolactin pro play a role in milk formation um it can be decreased by dopamine so as you all know dopamine is a, 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 a lactotroph inhibitor so it acts on the lactotroph in the pituitary gland um, to inhibit the release of prolactin um, so that's why it can reduce milk formation so we just talked about this so oxytocin is um, released from the posterior pituitary gland and it's essential for milk ejection so um, if you destroy the posterior pituitary gland, um, it will affect milk ejection. Okay, so um, the menstrual cycle. So when we talk about ovarian or menstrual cycle, the most important thing is the, um, this um, diagram here. So yeah, uh, you, you, know, you, you might get a question where you have to fill in or, or even draw yourself but you know you might have to fill in um the blank what hormone this is um or what hormone this is or what target this is um and the feedback of it so learn this learn this um, very carefully so yeah so you start off with hypothalamus releasing gnrh which then cause pituitary to release um fsh and lh um, which then acts on the ovaries, specifically the granulosa cells, um, to to um, uh, produce progesterone and estrogen. Inhibin also um, work um, in the negative feedback loop. So don't forget this one. Okay, so I have a couple of slides on just the different effects of of the main hormones. So FSH is about recruitment of follicles. So this is the one that is important for follicular genesis. So it increased number of granulosa cells as well as um, as well as increase the number of follicles that will undergo follicular genesis. Um, and it stimulates estrogen production as well. Luteinizing hormone 
act on the theca cells as well as the granulosa cells. So we don't talk about the theca cells much, but when um, LH acts on theca cells, it um, increases uptake of cholesterol, so lipid in general, um, and also it, it makes um, um, antigen. Um, the LH search is probably the most important thing about LH, um, and this is triggered by meiosis resumption. So when um, uh, yeah, when, when follicular genesis happened and meiosis continues, um, then you have an LH search around the middle of the cycle, um, which then lead to increase in prostaglandin secretion, and um, these are the effects of it. So it's quite specific. Okay, so um, estrogen and progesterone, um, they all may overlap, but estrogen is generally produced by granulosa and theca cells. So it's produced by the, the, the ovary, by the follicles. It's also produced some other places like liver, adrenal glands, or breasts. Um, and it acts, on, it acts on the granulosa and the theca cells. It acts on itself to induce FSH and LH receptor. So it's a cycle that just help enhance the whole negative feedback and then it, it just keep it going. So, you know, this hormone will get prepared for the other hormones um, and it creates a loop. So it is, um, estrogen is the one that acts on the glands as well as the stroma of the endometrium and it increases mitotic activity. So with menstrual cycle, when you have uh, during the secretory phase and you have proliferation of the endometrial wall, it's because of estrogen. <coughs> All right, um, and progesterone is produced by granulosa cells of the corpus luteum. The action is on the endometrium and um, it converts endometrium to secretory phase. It increases body temperature um, and it suppresses maturation of other follicles on the same ovary. So it causes the other ones to undergo um, atresia. Okay, um, we have um, activin and inhibin as well. So activin, pretty much, um, it it increase it stimulates FSH. It increases FSH, so it it acts to stimulate everything. And inhibin is the opposite. It inhibits um, FSH secretion, um, and yeah, it, it's um, it's the opposite of activin. And it, its name speaks for itself. Okay, so anti-malarian hormone. This is the one that tells you about the reserve, the ovarian reserve. So the concentration of anti-malarian reflects the non-growing follicle population of it. And it is produced by pre follicles. So the more the more follicles, the, the more follicle you have left, um, the more AMH is produced. And uh, that tells you that you know you still have um, a bit of ovarian reserve, and it decreases with age, obviously, because you lose follicle along the way. Okay, so yeah, so the um, ovarian cycle, I've got um, pretty. It, it's a step by step thing um, in here, but we probably um, don't have enough time to talk about it in details. But um, eventually, it, it's all. It all comes down to. Um, this picture. So everything that you need, pretty much everything you need to know about the ovarian cycle, as well as the menstrual cycle, is in here. Uh, and the you, need to, you just need to learn the changes in hormone level, um, including the LH, FSH, and then the change in um, estrogen and progesterone as well, and how that affects the endometrial wall. Okay. Yep. So we'll skip through that. All right. Um, so the thing about uh, menstruation, menstruation happens when you have a maximum level of prostaglandin, which then leads to arterial constriction and then ischemia and then desquamation. So that's the mechanism of shedding of the endometrial wall. So because you have ischemia, um, 
you have tissue black breakdown and eventually bleeding and that's what happened in menstruation so the proliferative phase of the menstrual cycle is when you have a lot of estrogen which then um, increase mitosis um, in the glands and the stroma of the endometrium and the endometrium thickness will then increase from around two millimeter to more than eight millimeter and in the secretory phase which is a, a fixed 14-day process, um, it, it is going to be due to the action of progesterone. So progesterone here will then restrict mitotic activity um, and then start to uh, prepare it for, for shedding. Uh, okay, so quick question. Okay, so here are the answers. Um, the first one, uh, at, so at puberty, you have around 400,000 um, follicles left, not 100 million, that's a lot. And um, the second one is true. So the, the reason that you have increased estrogen level in chronic liver disease is because the liver plays a role in, in the breakdown of estrogen. So when the liver is not functioning as well, um, estrogen is not being broken down and it's just circulating around the, your body. Um, and so that's why in male you have a, um, you know, gynecomastia. Um, so that's, that's more feminine features. That's why you look for gynecomastia in GIT um, examination. Okay, um, yeah, and right, so we just talked about it. So estrogen is very important for mitotic activity of the um, endometrial wall. So that's the proliferative, proliferative phase. Uh, so estrogen is important for proliferative phase. Um, it is progesterone that initiates um, the secretory phase of the cycle and inhibit inhibit suppresses um FSH because that's um yeah okay so menopause um in menopause you have a progressive decline in follicle numbers you have a progressive rise in FSH um estrogen doesn't fall until late um and but you don't have any change in testosterone so yeah so it's just a list of things that happen you know in menopause I, what kind of things can happen to what kind of hormones um, and it's pretty much just memorizing so these are the features that that um, a woman can um, experience in menopause and I guess um, it, it might be important um, for, for clinical skills. So, you know, in OSCE, you know, you might get a, like a station or something and somebody's asking, oh, if, if I'm approaching menopause, what kind of problems can I have? And you just remember the signs and symptoms, oh, the symptoms pretty much, um, and, and tell them. Okay, but with menopause, the main thing to be worried about, um, so three things. So bone loss and osteoporosis, Second one is the metabolic syndrome, so high cholesterol, um, high L LDL, low HDL, um, insulin resistance, and the risk of diabetes. And lastly, cardiovascular problems, so risk of atherosclerosis and um, ischemic heart disease. So those are three things you need to worry about. Okay, so quick question. Okay, um, 
So here are the answers. Um, so menopause, menopause is not caused by failure in secretion of gonadotropin. It's, it's failure of the ovary to respond to gonadotropin. Um, and menopause is characterized by a decline in inhibin secretion. That's true. That's why you have a progressive rise in FSH because inhibin inhibits FSH. So without inhibin, um, you have increased FSH. The, uh, the age of onset of menopause and the age of menarche is actually not related. So yeah, there's no correlation proven. Um, and menopause correlates with reduced incidence of breast cancer. That's true because when you approach menopause, you have decreased level of estrogen, and estrogen is um, one of the risk factors. Well, it's, it's one of the causes for breast cancer. So there are different types of breast cancer, but one of them um, is it, it's it has um, it's caused because of high level of estrogen. Yeah, so that's what it is. All right, so. That's for the theme three stuff. The theme four stuff is it can happen. So in, in clinical skills, for exam, what they're going to ask you most about is contraceptive methods. So um, it's good to go to the table and then just learn them about mechanism and the pros and cons of each of the type. But I'm going to point out a few things. So remember that if you if you don't use any contraceptive at all, then the risk of pregnancy, the chance of pregnancy is 15%. Okay? Um, and when you think about when you think about contraceptive, um, it, it's best to classify it into hormonal or non-hormonal type. So these are the hormonal one, the pills, implanon, maneuvering, um, and depot. And then the non-hormonal ones, the barrier, the barrier ones, the um, the copper IUD. Or other methods, okay. And the reason is because when you classify it that way, the hormonal methods will have a, a set of common side effects. So if it's because of hormones, you have bleed between periods, you have sore breast, headaches, bloating, mood swings, um, changes to skin, um, and it can be affected by St. John Wort or anti-epileptic, um, specifically the pills and implanon. So it's good to remember this one. And of course, it doesn't protect against um, STI. So the non-hormonal one, the main thing about it is that it perfectly, so perfect use, then it's great. It's above 99%. But if you only use it, um, if it's only a typical use, so you don't, you know, you don't adhere, adhere to it very well, then it, it's much less effective than hormonal one um, and so it drops to so let's say it's condom if it's typical use then it drops to about 70 80 percent um, only protection only okay yeah uh, the other thing is um, with progesterone only pill um, it, it's good to remember this one specifically because it's only that one that if you want to use the pill but you're breastfeeding or you have migraine or a smoker or above 35 year old and, and, and obese. So a lot of a lot of um, um, bad things going on, then it's good to use the progesterone only pill rather than the combined one. Um, Implanon is the one that lasts three years. So if somebody doesn't want to have to repeat, you, you know, to have to remember to take some to take the pill or repeatedly do um, to maintain contraception, then you can use Implanon. Um, Depot is the one that involves injection. Um, hopefully, you don't have to choose this one. Um, and uh, with emergency contraception, it's good to remember the number. So it works best within 24 hours, but after that, within 96 or 120, it, it starts to decrease. But um, it, it can be effective. But after 120 hours, it probably won't help anymore. Okay, so. Um, for, yeah, that's pretty much that for reproductive. The other thing that you need to, you probably should revise for MST is um, to go back to pelvic anatomy and then revise the GIT as well as the urinary tract um, system as well because it might come up um, and as well as do it and learn the neurovasculature 
um, as a whole, as a big picture. The last thing is, oh, hang on, one, one second. The, the last thing is um, in terms of clinical skills. So you, you, you might notice that with when when they have um, an exam, there's got to be questions from all components. So that's include clinical skills as well. So that's where you have to, um, and, and it'll be about you know ten marks something. So, but the only thing that can be tested mainly here with this this exam is um, contraceptive for reproductive. So they will will be more likely to chuck in question from cardio and rest um, clinical skills um, for for the MST because you know you, and that's that's where the ten percent from um, last semester or last year will come from. So if you're going to revise something for the MST that comes from last year or last se last semester, um, do the clinical skills one. Okay, and that's pretty much it. Thank you, guys. That's all right. Thank <laughs> you.